y'all woke? I didn't mean that like metaphorically. I meant like, seriously, you woke? Because some of y'all was in the lobby last night at like 1 a.m. And I was like, I don't know how they're going to make it throughout the day. I don't understand. Um, the world that we live in is a dark place. And of course, even now, the sun is still out. People are outside living without a care in the world. Families are at the park laughing as their children play with reckless abandon. Couples are probably eating breakfast together, commenting on love and politics and what they will make for dinner. Yet, at the same time, there is a girl somewhere, somewhere in the world being recruited or kidnapped so she can be sold as a piece of sexual merchandise. And in another part of the world, there is someone being killed over drugs or jealousy or money or even melanin. We live in this place where there is so much beauty and yet so much darkness. And lest we think that this darkness is outside of us, one survey of, survey of our hearts will quickly remind us that we too are carriers of evil. How did this happen? Surely when God made the world, he made it good. So how is it then that the world and us seem to be so bad all the time? The answer to that question is in Genesis 3. If we have our Bibles, I would love it if we turn, or should I say click there. I'm going to read verse Verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Before the serpent showed up, God had done some big things like make the world for one. And not only that, but he'd also made humans. First, he made Adam. And the way he made Adam was so spectacular. He just took some dust or dirt from the ground and made a whole man out of it. Then he breathed into his nose so that Adam would become a living creature. Then when it was time to make woman, he decided to go a different route. He didn't use dust or dirt this time. He preferred to use a bone. One of Adam's bones to be exact. He made Adam go night night. Then he took one of Adam's ribs and made Eve out of it. So you have God, the world he made, and the people he made to live in it. Now, their specific home was not just earth, it was Eden. A beautiful garden, which to me, I imagine looked a lot like Wakanda, but that's just me reading into the text here. That, that's a little eisegesis. Anywho, when they got into this garden, God told Adam in Genesis 2.16, not Eve, but Adam, you may surely eat of Every tree in the garden, you got so many options, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This is significant to me at least because even in a state of perfection, God still had boundaries that he wanted his creation to live within. And any attempt at crossing those boundaries by way of disobeying God's command would guarantee a consequence. Sometime after God commanded Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the serpent shows up. This 
serpent is the devil. The devil was a created being just as Adam and Eve were. He was created to serve God as an angel, but because of pride, he rebelled and became endlessly obsessed with doing everything that God hates. So when Satan embodied this snake, his motivations were not holy. So whatever he is about to say to Eve will not be for her good or for God's glory, but it will be to her demise if she believes him. He says, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? First of all, Satan is, is rude. Um, he, he didn't even say hi here. He, he just goes straight into questioning Eve about God's command. And for him to even know the command means he was nosy too. That means he was there when God told Adam the command or when Adam told Eve the command. But either way, he is very aware of God's words and it is the exact thing that he wants to challenge. But why would he go that route? Why would he want to challenge the Word of God? Why would he question Eve about what God said? Because if he can get Eve to doubt the Word of God, then he can ensure that Eve will doubt the person of God. The root of all sin is unbelief. If you dig deep enough into the particular sins that you struggle with now or the particular sins you were enslaved to before Christ, you will discover that at the core of these sins was and is an unbelief in the Word and thus the person of God. How many of us have entered into certain relationships simply because we didn't believe that God was really a comforter? How many of us have refused to turn the other cheek because you didn't believe that vengeance really was the Lord's? How many of you even in Christ fall into legalism time and time again because it's hard for you to believe that the gospel is just that sufficient? Sin doesn't just happen. It happens because somewhere in our minds we have concluded that God's Word cannot be trusted. And if God's Word cannot be trusted, then God can't be trusted. Most, if not all, temptation starts with the question that the Satan had for Eve. And the Satan knows this. And this is why he phrased his question the way he did. He said, did God actually say? It wasn't necessarily his question that was the problem. It was what his question implied. It implied that there was the possibility that what God said wasn't true. And what does Eve say back? Let's read verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree. First of all, why is she talking to the devil? I don't think she should have been thrown off already because a snake is talking to me. You should have known something was up. But she's innocent, I guess. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Do you know what's interesting about Eve's response? Is that she says something that God never said. He surely said not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was in the midst of the garden, but he never said she couldn't touch it. So as Eve is questioning her and accusing God, she in turn is unclear on exactly what God said. That's that's another sermon. But either way, what she doesn't realize is that the serpent did not ask the question because he cared about listening to her response. This is not a conversation, even though it might seem as if it is. This question was only the means by which he could turn her heart away from God. Satan being done with being subtle, gets straight to the point. Verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan lied to Eve, but he actually told more than one. The first lie was that she'd be able to escape the judgment of God. That even when she sinned, And of course, he doesn't want her to think that her disobedience is sin, but rather a logical act of the will. But even then, he wants her to believe that she will be able to eat the fruit 
and get away with it. And this is clearly a lie that resonates to this day. We, by we, I mean all of humanity in general, tend to believe that we will be able to lie and steal and be proud and unloving and unkind and racist and envious and greedy and sexually immoral and live lives eating from the trees God told us not to and that God won't do anything about it. It's the lie that says, yes, You can break God's law freely, and you need not worry about judgment. This lie has also morphed into something else that isn't as obvious. Sometimes it sounds like God is love. And because God is love, then He surely won't do something as terrible as sending anyone to hell. Or if God's character is not twisted into something highly unbiblical, then the alternative is to take the commands of God and say that they're not commands at all, but they're just words that are open to our own subjective interpretations of what they mean. Where we choose what is sin and what isn't while living under the deception that disobedience is not disobedience if I have defined the terms of what I am to obey. The second lie was that God Himself was a liar. God said, the day you eat with the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. God did not say you might die. God did not say you could die. He didn't say if you eat more than one bite of the fruit, you'll die. He said the day you eat of the tree, you will die. This death would not be eventual, but immediate. But Satan tells Eve that that's not the case at all. And if that is not the case, then God lied when He told Adam that they die. The temptation is to believe that God is not a God of His Word that He is not a God that tells the truth, that He is not a God that backs up His threats. Clearly, in Satan's opinion, everything that God says is not worth believing because it won't happen anyway. And of course, if Eve is to believe that God is a liar, then who will she believe is the honest one here? The devil, of course. Do you remember the last time you thought God was lying to you? If nothing specific comes to mind, I'll help you. It happened the last time you read the Scriptures and concluded that what you read wasn't true. Many of us would never say that we think God is lying, but we consistently live as if He is. This is even more troublesome, yet common for those who are in Christ, because All of the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. So when he tells us that whoever believes in his name will not perish but have eternal life, how does that change how you live in light of eternity? When he tells you that he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ever ask or think, how does that change how you pray? When he commands you to cast your cares on him because he cares for you, do you believe him? You know you don't if you keep carrying those cares. Does that have any impact on what you do with your burdens when God says that he loves you enough that he wants them all? The word of God is to be believed because God is not a man that he should lie. The last lie is that her sin would deify her. Let me read what Satan said again in verse 4 and 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What an intoxicating thought that just by eating from a tree that she would become like the creator of the tree that she would be like the one who made her from a rib, that she would be like the one who made her husband from the dust of the ground. Who wouldn't want that kind of power, that kind of intelligence and wisdom and authority? But I'll tell you who wouldn't. Those who are unwilling to disobey God in order to get it. But you got to know that when sin is involved, the human will is not content with submission to God. Neither does it find joy in God being Lord. The human will doesn't delight in serving God naturally because it wants to be Him. Have you noticed the same language before, this 
desire to be more than what we were created to be. I remember when Kanye, on his album, Yeezus, he came out with a song, I Am God. I liked the beat, felt a little weird listening to the lyrics though. But a few years back, it was so offensive to many people that this human being would say that he was God. I found myself wondering though, if we are all as easily offended at our own silent attempts to be God. We may not say it out loud or make a song out of it, but the song surely plays in our hearts daily. There are many ways in which this addiction to being God can play itself out, but what it all boils down to is that we want the freedom to do what we want, when we want, and how we want. Sin leads us to believe that this is real freedom, that being God is the way to true happiness and liberty, but is actually in the pursuit of usurping God's throne that we will find ourselves under the judgment seat of God. When the devil told Eve that she would be like God, knowing good and evil, he actually wasn't telling her the whole truth. God being God knows good and evil because he knows everything. So in a sense, her eating from the tree would give her a knowledge of good and evil that she did not have. But what the devil didn't tell her is that she would not know good and evil in the same way that God does because she would know evil experientially. God is holy. He has never and will never know evil from personal experience. He only knows goodness this way. He knows evil like the doctor knows cancer. Something he fully understands, but as something that is totally outside of himself. But when Eve disobeyed the commandment of God, she would not know evil like a doctor knows cancer, but she would know, e she would know evil like a patient knows cancer. She would not become the physician, she would become the one who is sick. In her deception, she didn't realize that by sinning against God, she would become inherently unlike God because this evil would not be something over there, but it would be completely inside of her. And after hearing all these lies, what does Eve do? Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, these are all good words, that the tree was desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloth. Eve chose to believe lies. The ultimate lie being that a created thing had more to offer her than God himself. And when her husband, who was with her, believed it by eating from the tree, it was set in motion that everyone that would be born after them would believe the same thing. But before we end, I want us to quickly look at the immediate impact that sin had on Adam and Eve's relationship with each other and their relationship with God. Let's read verse 8 and 9. And they heard... The sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? So imagine this, if you're Adam and Eve, your eyes have just been opened because of sin, you are aware of your body in such a way that causes shame and a whole bunch of other stuff you didn't have to do it, deal with when all you knew was goodness. And so you cover yourself with loincloths to cover your shame, not only from yourself, but from the partner you, God created for you to be totally free with. That act is a glimpse at what sin immediately did to relationships, and not just romantic relationships, but all relationships. It made it a place where people are afraid to be free. So what do people do when they aren't free? They hide from each other. You wonder why you isolate yourself when you're in sin because you are afraid to be free. The death that God said would happen the day they ate the fruit, this is a part of that. They might have thought that God was just talking about physical death, which he was, but he was also talking about spiritual death. Their eyes were opened because sin and death had entered into their souls and made them see God and themselves in a way that was not good and not true. Then, 
as if this was a common occurrence in the garden, they heard a sound. The text says it was the sound of God walking in the cool of the day. And it doesn't say that God was running in the garden as if he was in a rush or stumping through the garden as if he was coming to scare them. But it says that he was walking. The people God created for his glory and who had just fell from it, he is still approaching them calmly as if to remind him that his presence isn't to be resisted but welcomed. But as sin always does, it distorts our view of self, and this is why we hide from the truths about ourselves, but this is also why we hide from God. The text says that when they heard that God was coming, they hid behind some trees. Now, my initial thought is if I had just sinned and I heard God walking in the garden, I'm going to hide too. But even if it makes sense, it's actually very foolish. Why? Because it doesn't matter where you go, you cannot hide from God. But because of sin, we are deceived into believing that we can. The pride in us wants us to believe that God isn't all-knowing or present everywhere. We might be able to hide from our pastors, our friends, our families, but there is no sin that God cannot see no matter how skilled we've gotten at concealing it. And also, hiding from God behind a tree can't protect you from God. I know that sounds obvious, but think about it. Adam and Eve figured that if they could just get behind the tree, maybe that would keep them from the judgment of God. As if this tree was a mediator between them and God. And we do it too. We think maybe if I just be a good person, it'll make God okay with me. Or maybe if I just fix myself up when God approaches, he'll be happy. Or maybe if I just busy myself with ministry, God might not be able to see all that I'm trying to hide. But there is nothing that we or they could do as human beings to fix what had been broken between man and God. All that tree was doing was separating them from God even more. And if they would have understood him rightly... Once they heard him walking in the cool of the day, they wouldn't have walked. They would have ran pleading for his forgiveness, knowing that it is only God that can make us right with God. But once again, they decided to trust a created thing more than the creator. Then in verse 9, God asks Adam a question. He says, where are you? Do you think God asked that question because he didn't know the answer? He's God. Of course he knew where Adam was. God asked that question because he was giving Adam an opportunity to confess. The question was to pull out of Adam the reason he was hiding from the God he never hid from before. Even before the beginning, even from the beginning, God was making room for the confession of sinners. He knew what Adam did, and he knew what Adam would do before he did it, but he still just wanted Adam to be honest. God doesn't tell us to confess because he doesn't know the truth we're trying to keep to ourselves. We confess so God, in his mercy, can forgive us and cleanse us from what we are confessing. Before the fall, there was no need for confession, but after the fall, confession must fill up our days because sin does. As the story continues, God in his justice curses all that were involved in this rebellion against him. He curses the serpent, Eve, and then finally Adam. But I want us to pay close attention to what is said when he curses the serpent. Because surprisingly, in the midst of the curse is hope for the cursed. Verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise 
his heel. God tells the devil that there will always be hostility between him, his, house, his offspring and hers, but then he mentions this random male that will be the offspring of this woman. He says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I love this part. Who is this man that would eventually be born after Adam and Eve that would have the power and the ability to do something as incredible as defeating the serpent. And I use the word defeat purposely because I know it's easy to read the word bruise and take this text to mean that this serpent will leave this particular fight with this particular offspring alive. But another way to say it is this offspring, this man will not only bruise the serpent's head, but he will break it. This serpent will indeed break his heel But we all know that if someone attacks your heel, you might be a little injured, but you won't be dead. But if someone gets a hold of your head and breaks it, you are done for. This man that would eventually come from the offspring of this woman that would not be defeated by death, but would actually overcome all death and all sin was Jesus, the Son of God. And though... He would be born inside of a world full of sin because of Adam and Eve and be in a body tempted by sin because of Adam and Eve. He would not do what they did. He would never believe that sin is better for food because he would trust that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He would never believe that sin would be desired to make one wise because he trusts that the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. And he would not believe that sin is delightful to the eyes because he would endure a cross for the joy that was set before him. And what was that joy? That joy was a sight of the living God, Jesus. Jesus would and has done what Adam and Eve didn't do, which is please God perfectly. And he has done what Adam thought a tree could do, which is to fix the brokenness between man and God. Jesus, by becoming a curse on a tree, is a mediator between us and God. So even though we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we are now able through repentance and faith to stop hiding from the truth of who we are as sinners and instead run to His grace for mercy. This world is indeed a dark place. And apart from Jesus, much of this darkness lives inside of us. But seeing that God is not a man that he should lie, what he said back in Genesis 3 happened. Eve's offspring crushed the serpent's head. And now you, being his offspring, can do the same thing. Let's pray. God, you are good to us. I thank you that immediately after sin came into the world, you had the gospel ready. You had already prepared hope in Jesus Christ. I pray that we would believe you. I pray that we would believe your word, and I pray that it would change our lives and that we would trust you forever. In Jesus' name, amen.